Coming up in this episode of KMOS Presents Missouri Life. We're on the road to Columbia, Missouri, where we'll learn about log boats, climb to the peak of a tall tower, and meet the woman eclipsed by the Statue of Liberty. KMOS Presents Missouri Life. Let's discover. Funding for KMOS Presents Missouri Life is provided by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Today's Columbia, Missouri was founded, well, it kind of depends. It might be the first settlement in 1818, or it might be after a move in 1821. Either way, the area known today as Columbia had long been populated by the Osage and Missouri tribes. And after Missouri became part of the U.S. in the Louisiana Purchase, the Smithton Land Company bought 2,000 acres, which formed Smithton in 1818. But water troubles caused the original settlers to move into the area that now forms downtown Columbia. And in 1821, Columbia was named after Columbia. I was the female personification of the United States before that troublemaker Statue of Liberty moved here from France. Within just a few years of its founding, Columbia already had the Columbia Baptist Female College, known today as Stevens College, and had set aside land for a state university. Nope, not yet. Uh, sorry. Then, in 1839, Columbia College was formed. Nope, wrong one. Uh, sorry. Formed in 1839, Columbia College would later become a state university known as the University of Missouri. There you go. <laughs> Columbia grew through the 19th century, first as a stagecoach stop on the Oregon and Santa Fe trails, and then later as a rail hub. During the Civil War, Columbia was a base for a large number of Union troops, sparing the city from the destruction that visited many other cities in the area during the war. Throughout the 20th century, Columbia continued to grow as medicine, education, and insurance sectors got stronger. And with that growth came other cultural powerhouses like the Missouri Theater, Citizen Jane, and True Falls Film Festivals, We Always Swing Jazz Series, and the annual Roots and Blues Music Festival, all making Columbia a pretty swinging town and cooler sounding than Smithton. Really, dear, that Liberty Woman should have moved to Columbia, not New York. Her loss. What happens when you take a group of amateur brewers who love music but love beer more? Well, you get Log Boat Brewing Company. Well, myself and Andrew Sharp and Judson Ball, my two other business partners, and I, we were brewing in my garage, just home brewing, playing music in a band, and you know, the, the jam sessions turned to brew sessions, and the, the beer was turning out better than the music, and we started looking at the market here in Columbia and recognized that, that no one was distributing beer. We had Flat Branch and Broadway, which were both brew pubs, and you couldn't get any local beer besides, you know, Schlafly or Boulevard and St. Louis, Kansas City. And so we definitely noticed a need in the market for it. Um, we'd been brewing for a while and just started kind of pursuing it, talking to people, taking our beer around to different bars and restaurants and kind of feeling the water and see what the response was to the idea of a local craft brewery that was distributing and got a lot of good feedback and yeah we figured oh yeah six seven months we'll have a brewery let's do this and you know, three and a half years later we were still planning and trying to raise money and get things started but um, it was it's been a long journey for sure one thing that makes log boat unique to columbia i would say is our physical space behind me the huge fenced in yard that we've dubbed the shipyard for Concerts, games, just relaxing around a picnic table with friends and family. Um, the tap room itself is a neat place to come in and have a beer, get to see us making the beer. We have the huge windows that look into the brewery and 
It provides a unique opportunity for us to engage with our customers and educate them about our products, how they're made, why we do the things that we do, and yeah, just we, we dub it our educational room. Um, so a lot of good conversation and you know introducing people to the Logboat brand. Whether you're Anheuser-Busch or Logboat, the process of brewing is the same. It all starts with the proper ingredients. We receive malted barley um, uh, that's grown throughout the world. Most of our barley that we use is grown in North America. And we take that and we crush it through our mill. And basically from that process, we're soaking those grains in hot water in our mash tun. And at that point, we're converting carbohydrates into sugars. And the, the brewer's job is to create a sugary liquid called wort. It's W-O-R-T. And each recipe has a different call for different grains um, and different hops that are used throughout the, the process. So after we've created our sugary liquid, we transfer it into our boil kettle. And at that point, we boil it with hops to add bitterness, flavor, and aroma. Um, after the boil is done, we move it into a whirlpool, which basically just helps clarify the work. Um, after that, we transfer it through a heat exchanger that takes it from near boiling temperatures to room temperature so that we can get it into a fermenter quickly to add yeast. And at that point, the brewer's job is just monitoring science. So the yeast is eating the, that sugar, byproduct being carbon dioxide and alcohol. So that's, that's where beer is being made. So the wort's transformed into beer and Hopefully everything goes well and we're enjoying it a few weeks later. So each recipe takes a little bit different time. Um, Snapper, our IPA, is the longest turnaround. It's about three weeks from brew day to package at, at a minimum. Uh, Mammut and Shiphead, those turn around in about 14 days. So each beer is a little different, but a lot of monitoring, a lot of uh, math and science that, that goes into the process. It's been incredible. This town has been super supportive. We've been blown away by the support from our retailers and, and from our patrons who like to come here and enjoy a pint. Um, we always knew Columbia would be the greatest you know, spot to open a brewery. Um, we're all Missouri boys that started this company and couldn't have picked a better city and we're excited for the future. There's a lot of good things happening here. A lot of other craft breweries opening up and getting their thing going too and we're proud to be a part of that for sure. Hi, my name is Eric Bodecker. We're here at the Wine Cellar and Bistro in Columbia, Missouri. Now, Columbia has so many wonderful places to eat, it was hard to choose just one. But with the Wine Cellar seed to table philosophy, I mean, we had to check that out. Let's dig in. The Wine Cellar and Bistro was established in 2003. My wife and I are the co-owners. Um, we've been focusing on using um, local, local Missouri products uh, since, since we began. Um, in the last a uh, couple years we've started the uh, garden project which is an extension of the wine cellar and bistro. I feel like farming has kind of been in my blood. Um, I started cooking when I was 18 and I, I have a great passion for cooking and, and tasting and not only cooking and tasting and eating food but presenting it to, you know, to our customers. Um, when people come um, it's, it really feels like a family here at the wine cellar. But as far as growing, growing the food, I like getting my hands dirty, being in the garden, um, working with the staff when they come out, working with my wife uh, as the farm manager and our kids help us in the garden. And it is quite a relief to go after a stressful day and you know, go and do some weeding or pick, pick some vegetables or plant some seeds. Um, it's, it's, one of, it's definitely becoming one of my main passions um, that I like to do. And to bring those vegetables and products into the wine cellar and to see them go out to the, our customers um, on their plates, uh, it, it brings me great pride to do that. My wife has been the sommelier of the restaurant um, for the past uh, 10 years, and we're a very wine-focused restaurant. We have um, local, um, organic, and sustainable wines. We won the Wine Spectator Award um, for the last 10 years. The Wine Spectator Award we received for the first time in 2005, and that actually says that you have one of the most outstanding wine lists in the world. And everybody who receives that award, um, which there are several, it says that. Uh, but it's something that I'm really proud of because the, the, it's not easy to get that award. You do have to submit your list, submit your menu, um, and talk about your wine program, how the wine is stored, and as it changes every year, I have to talk about that too. And so to receive that award every year is something that I'm really proud of. We have considered planting um, a couple acres of grapes um, and possibly you know, making small batches of wine or using it to make vinegar with um, for the restaurant. Um, mainly what we're trying to, 
to do on our farm because it's only 13 acres is to make it as diverse and sustainable as possible using um, permaculture techniques and um, all sustainable methods. Um, so the more diversity of plants that we have, the better off our ecosystem at our, at our farm will be. So right now we just added bees and we have chickens. Um, I use any sort of vegetable scraps from the restaurant to make compost. We feed and grind up oyster shells to feed to the chickens from our oysters here. So that's one of the main things and one of the great things about, about the garden project. I can actually take the rest, all the waste from all of our stocks and oysters, uh, paper towels that we use, and I can make compost with them and make, make black gold for, to grow our vegetables um, in, at, at the wine cellar. We've been evolving and ever-changing. Um, with the addition of the garden project and with the addition of our live music and, and piano that we have on weekends um, and just trying to bring Missouri local local products from our farmers right here in Boone County. It brings me great pride to serve in the city of Columbia and I, I can't thank um, them enough for, for their support. For more information, you can visit winecellarbistro.com. High above the streets of modern-day Columbia, gargoyles keep watch over the city from atop their perch in an old medieval castle, patiently waiting for a new crop of unsuspecting young people to arrive each year and pass through their world to be permanently changed. Of course, you might wonder, why is there a Gothic Revival castle in the heart of downtown Columbia? But Mizzou's Michelle Mazafraise says, no need to worry, the gargoyles aren't there for nefarious purposes. You're in the middle of Columbia, Missouri, and yet you're standing in front of a building that if you looked at it from far away, looks like a medieval castle. And this was I, very purposeful. The designers, the architects for this building, as well as many buildings on the campus, was a firm named Jameson and Spurl out of St. Louis, Missouri. And they typified what has been called collegiate gothic, which is gothic revival. And the, the benefits of collegiate gothic are that you can use local materials, which are inexpensive, and we had a great deal of limestone. But I think also, in a sense, it gives you a sense of resonance for a campus that is relatively young. The University of Missouri was founded in 1839. When you compare that to Oxford, which was founded in 1200, it's a baby, so if you have buildings that use collegiate gothic, they seem to have a sense of gravitas or a sense of being. Mizzou's Memorial Union Tower was started shortly after the beginning of the 20th century, a time when American universities were trying to prove they were just as important as the centuries-old places of learning in Europe. Well, it's an interesting story. It starts in 1915 when there's nothing here on this plot of land. And the idea was that students wanted to have a student union, which is something unique in higher education at that time. So they start a committee called the Missouri Union Planning Committee. And of course, World War I gets in the way and it's derailed for a while. And it starts up again in 1919 when Dean Walter Miller said at a commencement address, we need to build a memorial for our dead. And what you have then are students and alumni who are coming together with this planning committee and they're selling subscriptions for $100 a pop. And it's supposed to fund not only the tower, but a north wing, a south wing, and eventually a memorial stadium as well. But the money did not stretch far enough, and so the tower and the stadium got done, but the rest of the union didn't. So you have the tower and you have Memorial Stadium. For a long time, you just have the tower standing as the gateway on campus, and you don't have the other wings added until 1952 and 1963. The tower itself incorporates lots of medieval touches, along with some more modern elements as well. There are many elements in the tower and the buildings that hearken to Gothic revival in terms of the style of the arches, the spires, the use of gargoyles and mythological creatures. But you can also see on the tower there's some very specific elements that are related to Missouri. Uh, the M for Missouri, you have the Missouri State Coat of Arms, you have the U.S. Coat of Arms, you have the University of Missouri Coat of Arms, so there are elements as well that connect it directly to the University of Missouri. 
Sitting right in the center of the part of campus referred to as White Campus, the Memorial Tower is significant in another way as well. One of the most significant things I think about Memorial Tower is that it is purely a student and alumni focused project. It wasn't funded by the state or the university. They sold subscriptions and it was very heartfelt. You know, it starts out as, well, we need a, we need a student union. And then you get to the point where 117 University of Missouri students and alumni died in World War I. And World War I was a, a turning point for a lot of people. It is, it's the age of modern warfare and it was shocking to people. And students and faculty and alumni were very much aware of the import of the war. And so for them, this becomes a place where you can recognize sacrifices. You have to remember that the last war that the you, uh, the United States had experienced was the Spanish-American War, which I believe lasted three days. I don't know. It was, it was something pretty quick. And we did have three University of Missouri students who died during that war. But this is a significant moment, and they want to recognize students who many of them knew. There were students who had been football heroes. There were students who were related to some of the founders of the university as well as Columbia, Missouri. So this was very important to them. If you're ever looking for something to do on a Saturday morning in Columbia, a stop at the venerable Columbia Farmer's Market might be in order. This 30-year-old institution gives you a chance to try some real farm-to-table cooking. We started uh, on this location here in 1980. It uh, kind of started as a group of farmers that were selling in parking lots, gas stations that wanted a united place to start selling. Um, we've been here for most of the time. Uh, we're a producer-only farmer's market, which means that everyone has to grow or sell what they bring to this market. Um, additionally, all of our vendors have to reside and farm within a 50-mile radius of this location. So we do everything we can to keep it as fresh and local and healthy as we can. People drive from minutes away to try this beef. <laughs> Whether you're on the hunt for fresh strawberries or looking for steak, the Columbia Farmer's Market has a wide variety of locally produced products. But Smith suggests that you don't just jump on the first tomatoes you see. First of all, walk around. Don't, uh, don't think that the first tomatoes you see are going to be the only tomatoes in the market. Um, you know, look around and uh, talk to the vendors, talk to the farmers. If you are concerned at all about whether it be organic or if it was sp uh, sprayed with pesticides, um, how the animals are raised, talk to them. They're all more than happy and proud to tell you about their farming practices. The farmer's market also has live music each week. This week we found a sitar being played, which of course is exactly what you'd expect from a farmer's market in Missouri. But lest you think the farmer's market is just a place to get fruits and veggies, it's also a sort of open air classroom too. Uh, well we recently started a, uh, we have a, a booth here at the market where we have community organizations like the Columbia um, Area Career Center or CCUA, a couple Montessori schools they come in and every week they provide some type of activity for children that has something to do with agriculture, sustainability, um, farming, health, things like that. Part of the mission of the Columbia Farmers Market is to reconnect you with your food source. And indeed, we found that farmers at the market were anxious to chat with us about their process and how they raised it. I actually, uh, in 1980, uh, listened to a guy that talked about uh, soil health and how it affects uh, uh, how everything in the er everything comes directly or indirectly from the soil. And uh, he talked about, and at that time I was row crop farming, and he talked about how if you have an unhealthy soil, you have unhealthy plants, and if you have unhealthy plants and animals, you have unhealthy people, and how it all relates. And uh, uh, so uh, I just become convinced that the Lord didn't uh, design it that we have to poison everything to be able to survive. And so uh, we're firmly committed to organic agriculture. Part of the market's mission is also to make sure that sustainable agricultural methods are encouraged here in mid-Missouri. 
Organizers say the Columbia Farmers Market has experienced tremendous growth, with nearly 4,000 buyers sniffing turnips and close to 80 local farmers, producers, and artisans taking part each week. And as you can imagine, all of that keeps Smith running on Saturday morning. A little bit here, a little bit there. Uh, Saturdays I'm usually just kind of running around, making sure that everything's organized, that the farmers are in their right spots, customers are happy. Um, I also uh, help out at our information booth where we uh, are able to process credit cards and debit cards if you forgot your cash. Uh, we also take SNAP, which is uh, food stamps. Um, so anybody can come to our booth, our information booth called the Oasis, and swipe a card. So if you're looking to have a real farm-to-table experience, that's okay. You can bring the plastic, but you'll get real food. As an internationally renowned master watercolor artist, author, teacher, and world traveler, Paul Jackson's artwork has drawn top honors in national and international competitions. Originally from Starkville, Mississippi, he's made Columbia his home. I was always drawing as a child. My mother encouraged uh, any artistic behavior. Um, I was bored with everything else, so I spent a lot of time drawing as a kid. When I got in college, I had a couple of teachers that uh, were pretty good at watercolor. Took some classes, fell in love with the medium, really never looked back. I've worked in watercolor for about 30 years now. I've tried everything else. Uh, it's all exciting, but watercolor is the one that, that got me. I, I really see watercolor as the simplest medium, uh, but I guess it's all a matter of perspective. Uh, if it's hard, I really you know, I enjoy the challenge. Uh, I, I keep getting bigger and pushing the boundaries all the time. A lot of my paintings include birds. I've always had a fascination for birds. Uh, I dream about flying all the time. Uh, I guess sometimes I am the bird in my paintings. Uh, my childhood was filled with birds. My father's an ornithologist, so we had up close and personal birds all the time. Um, when I started painting, my paintings um, really were inspired by aerial perspectives. I used to climb a lot of trees, park in garages. Uh, I trained as a hot air balloon pilot uh, as soon as I could, so I flew balloons, but sort of flying and painting and looking down at the same time is a little hard. Uh, and even taking pictures while you're flying a balloon is difficult. But uh, when I discovered the drone technology, I was addicted immediately. Uh, my wife got the first one uh, for me as a gift, and it was probably a big mistake on her part. Uh, we quickly assembled a fleet of different drones and raced across the country, flying over everything that was inspirational. And there's a lot to see. Uh, from an aerial perspective, things that you're familiar with are brand new again. Uh, so things that used to excite you and don't, look at them from an aerial perspective and all of a sudden everything is different. Uh, it was probably the most addictive hobby I've run into and now we've sort of converted it into filmmaking. Um, when they put a gimbal on a drone and it became a still shot, uh, a, a smooth video shot, uh, we started picking up that habit too. And now I'm like amassing data banks of all of this film footage from the air. Another place from which Paul draws inspiration is in his travels, as evidenced by his book, The Wandering Watercolorist. He and his wife love traveling and have made numerous trips abroad to places like China, India, Turkey, France, and Cambodia, just to name a few. I think travel is probably my first passion, and maybe I paint to travel, maybe I travel to paint, I'm not exactly sure which, but uh, I thrive on it. We, we get home for two or three weeks, work in the studio like crazy, never leave the house, but then we need that intense travel right after that, so we go and we go. I like the unfamiliar. I like the challenge. Um, I, honestly, doing the same thing every day would kill me. We have to do something different constantly. Um, bigger, better, um, bolder. I don't know. I have to keep exciting myself with what I'm painting or I probably would lose the passion for it. So far, so good. Painting is hard. Uh, painting in watercolor is, is really a challenge, but teaching, teaching what you learn in watercolor is probably the hardest thing I've managed so far. I'm still perfecting it. I teach classes, uh, workshops around the world, and we get full workshops, but I think I'm learning as much as they are as I go. Uh, being an instructor is a lot of fun. Turning the lights on for somebody and helping them understand how the medium works is as thrilling as painting for the first time yourself. 
Young artists are my favorite. I love working with somebody who's got lots of energy and passion, and they really don't know how hard it is to be an artist, but uh, I get to fill them up with all these great inspirations and ideas and set them free and watch them go. I love watching the lights come on for people. Uh, to hand a uh, young artist a couple of tools and give them something to, to work with that they haven't had before is probably the most amazing feeling. Funding for KMOS Presents Missouri Life is provided by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.